Um, hello, um, my name is Nikki and I am a scientist on a mission. So I did my undergrad in virology, um, but I'm currently doing a master's in cell biology. So I want to essentially bring science to the general public and teach you about different pathogens and bacteria, like bacteria, viruses and stuff and how they infect the human body. Um, so as of right now in my first video um, I figured I'd make it about the coronavirus uh, um, but I've got my research and I wanted to essentially just digest what it is that we as scientists know about the coronavirus and what you should know about it um, so let's get started so part one um, so the virus what do we know about the virus itself um, so the virus is the coronavirus so it's um, it hasn't got a strain name at the moment. It's called 2019-N-C-O-R-V. So it's within the family of coronaviruses. So coronaviruses themselves are a large group of viruses. They've got the largest genome that we know of within viruses themselves. Um, and they are known to cause respiratory illnesses within the body. Um, either um, most mammals have got a coronavirus of their own. So bat coronavirus, human coronaviruses. Um, it's... A really large family so this new strain that's originated from China is within this family so um, we've actually sequenced the virus when it first came out um, China did a lot of work to sequence it um, the most noticeable um, type of coronavirus is probably the SARS um, then you've got the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome which is the Mars uh, coronavirus. So the 2019 N coronavirus is actually part of this particular family. So we know quite a bit about this family actually. So based on what we know about the structure of SARS and what it looks like, we can deduce that the um, the new strain is going to look some is similar to this. So the way that works is that the virus proteins that are on the outside are rec uh, recognized by certain receptors or recognized by certain proteins on our cells so in order for the virus to get in it needs to be recognized by our cells so that the it can then be taken inside the cell because it was a bat virus it wouldn't when it infected us it wouldn't have been able to get inside the cell so it would have just been passed on pretty pretty fine but there was a mutation within the bat um, and at the moment, we believe that there was actually a sub-vector, so another animal, so it went from a bat to another animal, and then to us. Alright, so part two. Um, this is about the disease and symptoms. So this is probably the bit that most people have heard through the media and the, the, the information that's usually given out to the general public. And what we know of the 2019 coronavirus, it causes respiratory problems. So the symptoms um, in the mildest form, you get a an upper respiratory infection. So it infects within uh, around your throat area and you get a fever and a cough, um, similar to flu, so you get flu-like symptoms. In the most severe cases though, in the people that have, have led up to death, part of their most severe, the severe cases, you get lower respiratory infection, so down closer, so it's gone down further down your throat, and, and it causes symptoms like pneumonia and bronchitis as well, so down um, infection of your lungs and stuff like that. The infectious period is about two to three days. So from when you first get the virus, it'll take about three, um, three to four days for you to exhibit symptoms. But for most people, they don't actually exhibit any symptoms at all because it's an asymptomatic disease. So your immune system, you can carry the virus within you, but you're not going to encounter any systems, um, any symptoms because your body will pass it through. Most of the deaths that have happened from the 2019 strain of the coronavirus are from people that have really low immune systems, um, immune compromised people, older people as well, um, babies as well. So people that don't have a functioning immune system and are not able to actually remove the virus by their own method. Part three, so I touched on this before, this is transmission. There is now confirmed human to human transmission and that's through aerosol, so breathing, droplets, stuff like that. When it first came out, we weren't sure if there was human to human transmission because of the way that the virus first came into humans. So patients zero was thought to 
have gone to the markets and it was a market down in Wuhan province in China and in this place there is a lot of animals that are kept and it's it's a market where there's fish there's animals and it's a largely unregulated market so when the 2019 strain first came to light we knew we had an idea that it came from this particular market um, so in that case it just shows that it was probably a zoonic transfer so when we talk about a zoonic transfer um, it's when a virus has gone from an animal to a human so we know that the 2019 coronavirus had to have come from somewhere and in the markets the zoonic transfer was the most likely case but because there were so many animals at the actual markets itself we weren't sure which one was the one that it's jumped from so there was a paper that came out a couple weeks after the so this was about two weeks ago when I was doing research for this there there was a paper that came out that was talking about the transmission having come from snakes um, because of the sequencing and the way that it was done these people believe that the 2019 strain originally came from snakes and then went down to to humans but there's a lot of holes with this this theory because like i mentioned before the beta viruses which is where this group which is the group that this 2019 strain belongs to um the beta viruses themselves are largely known to be zoonic transfers from bats so these are bat viruses and this paper says that you know most of the similarities that they saw with the virus were from snake specific viruses and now we know that not to be the case which is why i didn't make this video two weeks ago because i wasn't sure um so about two weeks ago they were doing genetic tests of the animals and the environment so looking at cages and containers within the markets to see if there was a positive test for the virus now we know that the virus um, was likely a recombinant virus that occurred from bats so similar to the subgroup of the beta coronaviruses um, so part four for the purpose of um, the length of this video I decided to make diagnose part four diagnostics and surveillance so how do we know when somebody has actually got how do, how do they test positive for the new coronavirus? How do they test positive for any viruses at all? In science, we have a procedure called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. So the way it works is because we've sequenced the virus itself, um, we have the entire genome of the virus. So because we know what family it's in as well, viruses have a specific um, family region, if that makes sense. So within the genome, there's conserved regions or so regions that are exactly the same within particular families in the same way that humans have got conserved regions in their dna so even though we all look different because we're all humans we have specific parts of our genome that are always the same and are the same within people within everybody so viruses have a similar thing so with, within the genome there's family specific regions that are conserved so we take that section or we take parts of the genome that we know to be within the family and that are specific to 2019 coronavirus and we can amplify that. A little recognizers called primers. So these primers are designed to recognize that specific region within the virus. So when you put in the sample like this bit after you've cleaned it up and purified it you put it into a test tube with these primers these little recognizers and you run it through like you run it through for like an hour and you try and amplify and replicate over and over and over again and you run it through for a while to see if these primers recognize any of the slots within that so if there is viral dna if there is the dna of the virus or that specific region that we're looking for then the primers are going to bind to the dna and then they're going to replicate it over and over and over again for the entire length of the duration of the, of the experiment and then we will over time have enough of the virus to say yes or no so if at the end of the PCR, there's huge amounts, there's sections of viral DNA, then we know that the person had it. If at the end of the experiment, there's nothing there and the primers didn't recognize anything, then that's a negative result. Because of the time constraints and the amount of people that are infected, you can't really do that with everybody. So we, 
that's part of the hindrance that we've got with the surveillance um and so like i said before most people that have got the virus are asymptomatic and don't exhibit any symptoms at all so how do you know to take to take samples spit or saliva samples from these people if they aren't exhibiting any symptoms and aren't going to go to the doctors um when sam when people test positive for the coronavirus and we put it into a database so that everyone so that the international scientific community and clinicians are able to see where the virus is going so part five five <laughs> um so now that we know about the coronavirus so the way that it's transmitted um the way that the disease symptoms that it causes, how we surveil and how people test positive for it, what are the treatments or the preventative methods that scientists um, and the international community has put in place for um, stopping people from getting the coronavirus itself. Um, unfortunately, there is no treatment available for the coronavirus as of now. Um, and it's because it's so new. If um, the it spread so quickly that by the time we've realized that it was a problem, by the time it was in, you know, 26 different countries and infecting thousands of people, we haven't had the chance to create a treatment for it. Um, the reason why we don't, and like I mentioned before, there's variations within the outside protein, so the spike and the M proteins and the envelope proteins and stuff like that, it just means that the antivirals and the drugs that we've got that are supposed to target specifically specific proteins within the virus or either on the outside or on the inside of the virus can't work for this particular strain because they are slightly different the, the membrane around the outside the proteins on the outside are different enough that the drugs that we've got aren't working the imperial college of london and the university of queensland in australia and other places in um in america um, have been commissioned to try and create a vaccine and they have been given essentially four to six months which is not a lot of time to develop something like this to develop an entire vaccine and put it out to the general public which is why treatment or vaccinations has become so slow if we don't control the transmission of the virus it will essentially We'll never be able to get rid of it from the population if we aren't able to manage and treat it now. So it would become another case like the flu where, you know, everyone's got the flu and there's flu seasons and it comes out and people get infected all the time. And there are multiple deaths from the flu, but because it's so contagious and we aren't able to control the um, replication cycle, um, the transmission rate of the, of the flu, we aren't able to remove it from our population. And I think that will... Um, if we don't make a vaccine in time or aren't able to treat the coronavirus in time, it will essentially have the same problem where everyone is going to come into contact with the coronavirus at some point in time and we aren't going to be able to control the transmission. So we actually know quite a bit, scientists themselves know quite a bit about this coronavirus. We're just trying to figure out how to attack um, the treatment plan and how to come up with preventative methods to control the spread but in terms of the virus itself we know its genetic makeup we know what the structure is we know um, how it's transmitted to people so we have this particular targets for drug development and vaccine developments we have a target we know we know what to attack in order to get it um, so I hope that if you or somebody else has been particularly worried about the coronavirus or haven't been sure where to get your information and, uh, and you know, it's just been this person's died and this person's died, which is, which is a problem. And I think, you know, we try to be really sensitive about, about that. If you have any questions about it at all, I've, I, I have done a fair bit of research. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Um, or I've got, I'm going to be posting, so all of my notes, this bad boy here um all of my notes i am going to be posting um on the website which i've got just there on the website itself i will have written down all of my references so you can go back um see what papers i came from um 
read what interviews and what other scientists have been saying within the virus um, and I'll include that as well. If you have any other viruses also that you'd like to know, um, this is just a little hobby for me, I think just to kill time while I avoid writing my thesis. Um, so as well recommend something and I can do the research um, for you and then be able to digest it in a video like a format like this or down in the blog which I will always link. Um, so so subscribe and comment below if you'd like um feel free to let me know what you think of the video um and i hope you have a wonderful day <laughs> bye bye